share what's going on. And you might be wondering why I am maskless up here. Uh, part of the CDC guidelines are if we're up on a stage and a platform separated by distance from you, uh, as a pastor and our singers and band, they at this time can still be maskless. However, once I get done preaching today and I head back down there to my seat, I'll put this back on. A little bit of the mask world that we live in. And I just wrote a little blurb here. Last week, as you know, I had my catcher's mitt here and for the online crowd as well. Uh, I had my catcher's mitt that my parents had bought me many, many years ago. And I got to tell you, I loved playing baseball. And all through this series, we've been talking about team, joining the team, our mission on the team, what some of our core values of this team are. And so we've been expressing that, spending time doing that. And last week, as I had that catcher's mask, and this week is the mask update unfolded, and now it's mandatory here for us in church to have masks, I, I thought to myself, you know, I remember when I was a catcher, my parents and my coach and coaches all throughout my time, through Little League, all the way up into high school, they provided me with gear. They didn't say, Matt, go out and catch and just trust this year. Trust in it. Trust in the process. You're going to be okay. I mean, I had not a mask like this, but I had a shell and then my mask over that. You had a chest protector. You had knee guards, shin guards those type of things. Ladies, I'll spare you the, the other guard that you had as a catcher, but men, you probably can figure it out. And so I had all this protection. And I just remember it, watching my parents, watching the coaches, they would do everything in their power to protect the catcher, to protect all players. And I think even as parents, we do that with our kids. remember back, it was never an issue for my generation, and I was talking to some people this week, I, I've always buckled my seatbelt. I've always buckled. It's just habit. That's what I was taught, and that's how I lived. And I mean, even if I go move the church van in the parking lot, it's just like remote habit. I don't know why. This I'm going to live it out, and as I do it, I'm going to be thinking of Mark 12:31, loving my neighbor as myself. So that's a little bit of the mask update. I know there's polarizing opinions. I know all of that, but man, if we can have church and I can wear a mask, I'm here. So I'm excited to be here and be able to jump into this with you this morning. One other announcement I want to share with you. For those watching online, and I had a great opportunity this week, Callie and I did, to drop off the you got when you walked in today. Those were online, and so uh, I, I, we put them out and we dropped them off at some various homes. Just wait a little bit later in the service. We'll take these all together online and in-house together. It'll be kind of fun to be able to do that as one body in Christ wherever we might be. I know some people are camping all the way at Christmas Valley. There's probably people at the coast. There's people still in here in town, obviously, as well. And so we'll be able to do that. Speaking of online and in-house, we don't have Connect cards that we can give you anymore. But if you go to the website or you go to our Bible app or you go on Facebook or YouTube, there's opportunities on there for you to fill out a digital Connect card. And it's pretty cool. I, I have received a couple of them from some of you. It's an opportunity for you to write down your prayer request, those type of things. So I encourage you to do that. It helps keep record of you guys since we don't have the paper ones anymore. But man, it's just cool to see that. And it comes in the email. And I have opportunity to pray over this thing. There are things on social God, in this season coming up more than anything, for gentleness to occur, that we can listen, that we can hear, that we can share opinions, but in a gentle format built on love. I'm tired of the yelling, I'm tired of the screaming, and so it's time, Lord, to come together. You have created us as one creation, and God, our, our, 
our role here as we've been looking at is to further the mission and kingdom of God, to be the light in these dark places, to present Christ for opportunity that you would not just use me, you'd use our church in those areas, God, wherever we might be, in workplaces and community spaces as we have limited travel this summer. We pray for opportunity to be the light of Christ where we go. We continue to pray for some of the needs of our church. I know Crystal is getting ready to have surgery in these upcoming weeks, and so praying for that as well. We pray all of these things in Christ Jesus' risen name. Amen. Well, I want to jump into it this morning. Uh, hopefully by now, if you've been here over these last few weeks, you've heard the mission statement. You're going to continue to hear the mission statement, even though we kind of wrap up our message to this morning on playbook. But the mission statement is just this simple thing of love God, love people, make disciples. Love God, love people, make disciples. Now, as we kind of come to this culmination, we've looked at some core values over these last four weeks. Uh, so the very first week, we said, man, if we're going to be on mission for God, we've got to be spiritual gifts. His Holy Spirit has given us these wonderful gifts. And that was the Holy Spirit. took one of those spiritual gift assessments home. I want to know. Let me know this week. Send me an email. Give me a call here at the church. We want to be able to create a space for you to begin to use those gifts in great ways. So we've been looking through all kinds of those things. This morning as we end, I really want us to understand the concept that we're part of this team. That's been the whole analogy with Playbook and this whole time is that we are a team. We're in this together. We're in this together. And as I've mentioned a couple times throughout this message series, to be victorious we all have a part to play. It's not just Pastor Matt. It's not just your church board. It's not just the pastor's wife. It's not just the people who sing. It's not, I keep going on and on and on. We all play a part. And so this morning message, I, I ran through a couple of titles. I thought, man, join the team. That's a good one. I think it is. And I said, let's just call it Get Started. It's time to join the team. It's time to get started. And so I want to turn this up in, uh, upside down a little bit this morning, a little bit, and we're going to approach this with an Old Testament character, but first we're going to spend some time in Hebrews 11, because I truly believe we're going to look at this gentleman, Moses, this morning. Many of us are familiar with, but I truly believe this statement, that you're never going to finish something that you don't start. Seems pretty easy to understand. You're not, never going to finish something that you don't start. And what we're going to find today is we're going to find in the motivation of, from God's word, we're going to look at one man, as I mentioned, Moses. Moses, who God used to simply start, who simply started. We're going to look at his life and how he's going to push us to begin something that God has called us to do. What is that for you? Because here's the thing, every single one of us has something that God has said, I want you to get started. I want you to do it. What is it? Maybe for you, it's just to, to repeat the mission statement. Oh man, pastor, I'm on board with that mission statement. Love God, love people, make disciples. Yes, let's print it on shirts. Let's print it on hats. Let's tattoo it. Maybe not that far, but... Now, let's just live this out. Let's just do it, and we'll say it, and we'll paint it on the walls. Well, here's the thing. All it is is words on a paper until it's started in our lives. I mean, I could stand up here every Sunday. Some of you could stand up here every Sunday and say, hey, love God, love people, make disciples. That sounds neat. That sounds nice. It's a great slogan. But is it something that we've started in our lives? Is it something that we've started? Maybe for you, it's time to start. It's time to start. I want to recognize they won't be on camera because I'm not going to spin the camera over there. But as we've been talking all throughout this series about joining the team, Jordan and Kate Fenters, you guys can stand up for just a moment. Just We can all see you. Most everybody knows you here. They transferred their membership over from South Salem. I love that. Kate has jumped in. Boom, I'm not going to touch what this is all about because who knows what. It's got a lot of sounds programmed into it. 
But that's joining the team. It's getting involved, gifts and abilities, jumping into stuff. And I know Jordan, God's got a plan. I'm waiting this pandemic. We're going we're gonna to do some stuff. And I'm excited to see what God is going to do as we have more and more people join the team. I love that. I love that. Maybe for some of us this morning, you've been an absolute workaholic. And your schedule is just so tight. You go, man, I don't have time to make a difference in somebody's life. You just need to get it started. What's left undone in our lives? Because we all have something. And many times, what we can do is when we, when we think about that thing, we can find ourselves, I think, in this cul-de-sac of indecision. Do I go right? Do I go left? Do I just sit at this stop sign and not move? Which way do I go? What I want to say to us this morning is sometimes when I find myself in this indecision, it's helpful to think of where I want to end up when I start something. I want to have a clear picture of where I want to end. I want to understand more clearly where I begin because I have a clear picture of what I want it to look like when it ends, where I end. So a little, little exercise for us this morning, here in-house, online as well, I want you to fast forward to the end of your life. Okay, I know it sounds a little morbid, but go all the way there. Let's presume you're standing there over your memorial service as most of us are having cheese and crackers, and we're discussing your life. What do you want them to say about you? What do you want them to say about you? What would you hope that they would say about you? Because in the answer, you may just find where you need to get started at. What you need to think about, what you need to be about, where you need to start. Because where you start, you're never going to finish there, right? We never finish things that we don't start. And so we're going to look at this guy, Moses, in chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, it's like the Hall of Fame. You ever go to the NFL Hall of Fame or College Football Hall of Fame or even probably here in town at some of the high schools, there's the Hall of Fame, the Mazama Wall of Fame or whatever it might be. And it lists these characters, these individuals in Scripture. And i got to tell you, I, I think we love to put these people away up on pedestals and maybe rightly so, but you know what? They were just like you and I. They were not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, some of the characters listed in the Hall of Fame. I mean, we can look at Moses' life. We'll get there in just a moment. But it's almost as if in Hebrews 11, God is spinning this moment. And, and maybe it's a stretch to say, I don't know, but it's almost a moment of like him eulogizing these Hall of Fame characters in Hebrews 11. I love what he says about Moses. When it comes to Moses, he says this. Moses, he says by faith, Moses, when he'd grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God, rather to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded this sake for the grace, for the grace of Christ as a greater value than the treasures of Egypt. He was looking ahead to his reward. What a thing to be said about someone, right? What a powerful statement that God just lists there in Hebrews. And that's where Moses ended, right? It's not where he began. It's where he ended. Let me help you, perhaps, and most of us have grown up in church, but maybe not all of us, and so I want to give the context of where he began. Some people are very familiar with this story, but let's just do it justice and, and talk about it and give some context to it, because he is an iconic figure in Scripture, we know that. And so what I want to do is just hit the rewind tape, and we're going to head back to Exodus. We just started all the way back in Hebrews at the end of life, now we're going back to Exodus at the, at the start there for Moses. He's born, he's born in Egypt. You have to remember at this time, the Israelites are held captive. The Egyptians are overseeing them. Pharaoh is in command of them. They are basically, they are, they're not basically, they are slaves to the Egyptians. 
They're there building pyramids, doing construction projects, all these type of things. Pharaoh begins to notice, and some of the government leaders begin to notice, whoa, 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 these Israelites, they're starting to like overpopulate us as Egyptians. This is not a good thing. This is not a good thing. And so Pharaoh decides, you know, we're going to do some population control because I don't want to see us as Egyptians being overthrown. We're the ones who have power now. These are our slaves. They're doing our work. And so we're going to do some population control where we're going to take the firstborn male. We're, going to, we're not going to let males live that Israelites have. And so Moses' mother hears about this, and she gets wind of this. And after having birth, in, in her wisdom, she said, you know what, I'm going to make a little basket, and I'm going to send Moses down the river. And it just so happens in God's orchestrated plan that Pharaoh's daughter is out bathing one afternoon in this basket with this little Israelite baby shows up. And she begins to care and take care of Moses. Now you have to remember he's an Israelite, but yet now he's being grown up in an Egyptian society. He has the best education, and not just an Egyptian society, he's growing up at the palace, right? This is Pharaoh's daughter. He's growing up with riches, with great food, great education. All of this stuff is going on. All of this is happening. And so Moses is living this. He's getting all of those things, and he's surrounded by that environment. One day at about the age of 40 years or so, he's overseeing a job for Pharaoh, and an Israelite and an Egyptian begin to spar and fight. He looks on, and he's like, hmm, something wells up inside him. He's like, I've got to protect my own people here, the Israelites. And so he goes down and he takes care of business. He takes care of business and kills the Egyptian. He gets what I've done. Oh, my goodness. And he's like, i got to hide this. This is not good for me, obviously. And any time we commit sin, this is just a whole other sermon right here. But what do we do? When we commit sin, we hide it. We rationalize it. We'll just bury it in the sand over here. And that's what he does. That's what he does. And he just sure hopes, and I'm sure he's hoping and praying, man, I hope this just never surfaces. I hope this just disappears. It'll never be brought up again. Well, the next day, (laughs) two Israelites are fighting. He goes down and he's like, brother, That he name his child, I am a foreigner in a foreign land. It's important to understand. He spends 20, 30, 40 years out in this wilderness experience. You have to remember, he has just left Pharaoh's lavish estate. And all of a sudden, one particular day, he sees this bush that's burning. It's not being consumed by fire. And he observes it burning. Now, that would grab most of our attention, I would imagine. And so it just continues to burn. And Moses, obviously, is drawn towards it. And he goes over and he checks it out. And he begins to have a conversation that it sues between him and God. Where God says, Moses, you're going back to Egypt. Dun, dun, dun. Moses is like, whoa, 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 going back to Egypt, like going back to Pharaoh, like going to say, um, excuse me, let my people go terminology. Yeah, that's what I want you to do, Moses. Every one of them, every one of them, just in case you don't know, that's millions of people at this time. It's the entire slave labor force for Egypt and for Pharaoh. It's a big deal. You know, walk up to Pharaoh and say, let them go. And Moses is like, I don't know about that. This is at the point where we're going to pick it up today. We're going to watch 
We're going to listen. We're going to dive into Scripture. We know where Moses ended, Hebrews 11. What we're seeing is where he began. But, but look at the conversation with God that he has just had. And we're going to see and we're going to find in this, we're going to find the motivation for what gets us started. The first thing, if you happen to be taking notes or scribbling down or putting it in your mind this morning, number one is this, that we simply need to start where we are. We simply need to start where we are. Where are we, church? Love God, love people, make disciples. Man, there's some stuff we got to be following after God. we got to be connecting with God. God has given us spiritual gifts and abilities. we got to be serving God. Absolutely start right where we are. Start where you are. Look at Scripture where God and Moses are talking. Now remember, God had just told him, you're going to go back, talk to Pharaoh. You're going to say, let my people go. Time out. Moses is like, time out. Hold on. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He's thinking, you know, like, come on, God. I killed a man 40 years ago. I'm sure in the, in, in the Cairo post office of Egypt is my face still, you know, like wanted man. Come find me. You know, they're going to kill me the minute I step back. I'm not going back. Who am I? God says something so powerful, powerful that God will say to all of us today. He says to Moses and he says it to us today, I will be with you. I will be with you. Don't miss the power of that simple phrase, I will be with you. Don't miss that. Don't gloss over it. Don't read through it fast. God will be with us. God will be with us because of our past. God is with us in the mistakes that we've made. We simply need to understand, just like Moses, that God says to you and I, today in this very moment, facing all kinds of turmoil in a country, facing a pandemic, I am with you. I gotta tell you, it gives you a little bit of certain confidence to do things that we wouldn't do otherwise. It gives us this confidence. You know, I'll be honest, I was, I was dreading this Sunday to a certain extent because I know most of us here are not big fans of these. I know this community, I've lived here long enough, and I know the opinions and so forth. So I was dreading this morning, and I wrote up something simple. I had something a little bit longer I was going to read, but I thought, you know, I'm going to keep it simple. But you know what? God is with me in those moments. God is with you in moments as well. He is with us. I remember years ago, years ago, I was asked to lead a delegation for NYC. The Nazarene Church does a big youth conference every four years, and I was asked to lead this delegation for our district. Now, I'm a planner, and I love all that side of the stuff and airline tickets and da -da -da, planning all this stuff and administrative deal. that was great and then you finally got there and we brought i can't remember i probably remember 60 plus 70 plus kids and adults and they're showing up and these are all different churches so it's not like i have a have a grasp on all these people and their lives that are going on and the event was going pretty well and it was doing well and it was a great event it was all on the lord's prayer and man, it was just eye-opening for our students. It was eye-opening for me as a pastor and an adult as we walked through that. When we get to the end part where any trip that you've ever been on, being an adult or as a student, you start just getting a little bit tired. You get a little bit crabby. And we had wrapped up the event. And we're getting ready to do some fun stuff. And that particular night, one of the girls on the trip, she ended up getting sick and dehydrated. And so we ended up going to... The hospital in Louisville, Kentucky. I always love good hospital trips. As a youth pastor, those are fun times. And Callie went because it was a female student. And so we ended up being there, felt like a long time. And so we ended up getting a couple hours of sleep. And then we went to this theme park in, outside of Cincinnati, Ohio. It was a great time. Of course, kids love that. And you would have found me in the hold up in the Starbucks coffee shop of, of Cedar Point. I think it was Cedar Point or somewhere in that area. 
the theme park, and I was just, there's a picture of me, I should have brought it and displayed it, of me with a coffee cup slumped down in a chair like half asleep as the kids are all going on rides and stuff. And so we had done this trip, and then we get back to our hotel, getting ready to fly out, and this is going on now like two days of about two hours of sleep, and I get a call from Southwest Airlines, the call that is going to upgrade us all to first class, because that's how it's going to be. No, it was the call that all of our flights had been canceled due to That just wasn't happening. And so we get there, and the lady's working. She's working on it. She's, okay, we can do this. You know, like 10 kids and four adults, and they can go to Baltimore, to Tampa, to Dallas, to Portland. I mean, these are great flights, right? And so we're looking at it, and then some of them were, okay, we can go from here to Houston. Uh, we can go from here to Baltimore to Tampa, to Vegas, to Portland. Oh, that's going to be a real winner. Somebody's drawing the short stick there. And then there was a group of us, they said, hey, you need to leave now. Get in your rental van because we have no more flights on these, but we have a flight out of Indianapolis. It's going to go Indianapolis to Houston to Portland. And so I jump with our Eugene group. I jump in with them because the van was in my name. We bust up to Indianapolis. We barely get on the flight. I am like, hook an IV into me. I don't even know what's going on. But all through this process of doubt, of fear, of how are we getting these kids back home? We can't just separate a 15-year-old and send him on his own flight. That doesn't work. God was with us. God was with us. And I remember even in those panicked moments, praying, listening, and feeling the confidence of God, Matt, Quit freaking out. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. Everybody made it back. One group ended up having an extra night in Vegas, but that's beside the point. But everybody eventually made it back. Here's the thing. No matter what we're facing, as I mentioned in our times right now, we have the confidence that not only comes from truly understanding who is with you, because when you know who's with you, it gives us confidence. God says to you today, I am with you. I am with you. And when I'm with you, we're going to do things together for my glory. We're going to make it through this time. We're going to make it through this time. Because I am with you, we're going to live out and love God and love people and make disciples. If you're not dead, you're not done. If you're not dead, you're not done. And God's got something he wants to do in you and through you because you have to start where you are. So the first thing is start where you are. The second point this morning is this, if you're taking notes, is you're going to use whatever you have. Start where you are, use whatever you have. We're going to use whatever we have. Now, despite God's I am with you moment with Moses, Moses is still kind of like, I don't know. I don't know about this. And God's like, no, no, no. I want you to go to Egypt. I don't know. What if Moses says, the what if game starts. We love doing that too. What if? What if they don't believe? What if they don't listen to me? What if Pharaoh, my head goes off? What if? What if? What if? What if? The Lord says to Moses in that moment, Moses, what's in your hand? What was Moses? He's a shepherd, right? So he's a staff in his hand. This isn't like some mystical thing here. It's a staff. It's what he used every day in his job. You know, if I was up here last week and I said I played baseball, I'd have a baseball mitt, right? That's what it was. That's what I did. And many times we once again read over this part of Scripture. It's powerful. Why? Because God takes that staff. Why did he have the staff? We already know. He had a staff because he's a shepherd. It's not some special magical thing, but God takes this ordinary staff 
and he does extraordinary things through it. He takes the staff, Moses throws it down on the ground, turns it into a snake, right? And he takes the staff back again. And he goes, take that staff. And, and what's amazing is Moses is going to perform miracle after miracle with that staff. He's going to touch the Red Sea and it's going to part. It's going to part as they're fleeing their enemies. He takes that old, ordinary staff and he holds it above his head. And God is going to do something extraordinary. He smites his enemies in front of him. It's unbelievable that when we simply step out, when we step out and we can take that thing that seems ordinary to us, God takes that ordinary thing and does extraordinary things through it. It's because God uses exactly what you have. And some of you might say, well, you know, I don't have a really flashy talent, Pastor. I just have a staff. It's not very cool. I don't have this flashy element or anything like that. Some of you said, well, I like, you know, I really enjoy cooking. I got to tell you, this week we had opportunity to stop by Alex and Shantae's house and drop a meal off. And they're just so blessed. Wow. Pastor, this is so cool. People are giving us meals. This church cares about us. This church loves us. An ordinary thing, like cooking a meal, is now blessing them. Blessing them. We have some, some people in our church who are older. And I know there's a group of guys who go to some of our older people's houses, and they help. They mow the lawns. And it's not because they, oh, I want to receive credit, or I want a little shiny thing in my crown. They do it because they understand the mission. They understand the mission of loving God, loving people, and making disciples. I've talked to him a couple of times. I mean, in the fall, raking leaves and college footballs on ESPN. Sometimes you'd rather just watch ESPN, but you know what? It's not about us. It's about serving God. It's about serving God. We all have opportunity to do those things. I've already heard of some people that have opened up their houses to do women's Bible study, to keep joy in the morning going. Well, I just have a backyard, or I just have this. It's an ordinary thing. God uses those things. What's in your hand? Use what you have, because what you have is exactly what God uses. You've got to start where you are. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter where you are when you know who you're with doesn't matter where you are when you know who you're with just use what you have because what you have is exactly what god wants you to have the last point this morning the third thing we're going to look at in the last point first is we got to get started we got to get started we got to use what god has given us and then the third thing is do what you can do what you can so moses we're still in this story here with Moses. He goes back to God with another complaint. And he's like, God, God, I, I need you to go. Moses is like, I, I, I don't know. He says, Part, pardon me, your servant, Lord. But I, I don't know, just even in our conversation, I'm not very eloquent in my speech, neither in the past nor since even you've spoken to yourself. I'm slow in speech, Lord. The Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouth? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or blindness? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak. I will tell you and teach you what to say. I don't know if it's just me, but I imagine there's a little bit of tension here at this point. I have a feeling God's like, are you serious? Are you serious, Moses? Go, I need you to get started. Moses is almost like, like I, I kind of think Moses is at the stage where last night, for many of you, if you have kids or you've ever had kids before, the bedtime battle, especially probably last night, it might be 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, it's time for bed. No, nah, I'm not tired. No, you need to go to bed. No, there's still fireworks going off. I want to stay up. No, you need to go to bed. Okay, 
10 seconds later. I need some water. Okay, let's get you some water. I need to go to the bathroom. Okay, let's go to the bathroom. Where's my, where's my teddy bear? It's right here. I need, okay. It's too hot with the teddy bear now, Mom. I, can, I mean, it's just like one thing after another, right? We've all been there. My pajamas are at you. My hair's, whatever it might be. You know, and all of a sudden as they're starting to fade off, you know, can we go to the moon? Can we go to space? Can, go to bed. Go to bed. Like, really go to bed. You sense that, I think, here in this conversation between Moses and God. Moses is continuing to be like, well, I don't know. And God's like, go, go, go. You have are the simple things. The ordinary become extraordinary when you walk with God. You're just going to do what you can. Now, Moses, go, go, go. I'm going to fill in the gaps, God says. It's not a big deal. Go, I'll teach you along the way. In other words, I'm giving you, I'm going to give you everything now so you feel equipped before you ever step foot towards Egypt. I'm going to teach you when you go. And many of us, I think we do that. Man, you know, I can't, I, who am I? I'm just an ordinary guy, like you said. Who am I? You say use what you have. Use what you have. Absolutely. Start where you are. Do what you can, church. What can you do? For some of us in this room this morning, we might be able to heal a marriage. Maybe you can apologize for for a part where you've wronged somebody. Can we all get up this morning and say right after church we're running a marathon? Probably not. But you know what we could do? We could begin to train to run the marathon this very day, right? We can do that. Here's the, the thing for a lot of us, including myself. We want the end result now. We do. Love God. Love people. Make disciples. Next Sunday, 250 people here. We're going to be baptizing 150 of them. There's going to be life change that we've never seen. I want the end result now. I think for a lot of us, you're like me. We're impatient. It's like, okay, God, when's this happening? I'm ready. Next Sunday? Oh, okay. Great. I'll, we'll be here then. And I'm always reminded as I read Scripture, from Moses to Daniel to all these different individuals all throughout Scripture, I don't think God sat down with them and said, here's the game plan, here's the playbook. I'm just giving you it, Moses. We're going to have a little tussle. You're going to doubt yourself. But let me tell you what. Let me tell you, Moses, Hebrews 11 is coming, so just live it and you'll be in Hebrews. Right? Daniel, you're going to face all these trials and all these. So let me just tell you what's going to happen. You're going to face some tough stuff. So here's the end so you can walk through it easy breezy. No, God doesn't do that. Start where you are. Use what you have. Do what you can. And when you do this, what happens is God takes that ordinary and he does something extraordinary. You might be looking at your situation, our world right now. Maybe God's calling you to do something, and you're just like, I'm overwhelmed with this. I love what the late Mother Teresa said. She said it this way. If you can't feed 100 people, feed one. Feed one. Start there. If you can't feed 100 people, start with the one. Get off the bench. Join the greatest team, the greatest team, the body of, the, body of Christ, the church. I'm not talking about NFL or MLB or NBA. Those are all neat teams. This is the greatest team. This is the greatest team. And you know what? I'm not even talking about politics. This is the greatest team. This is the greatest team. This is the team that watches lives be changed. This is the team that sees eternity change, church. This is the team that I want to step into whatever you call it, the lines, the fields, the batter's box, whatever description you want to use, I want to be on that team. 
And when you see Moses at the end in Hebrews 11, and he begins to step into the team, God does this incredible, unbelievable thing through an ordinary person. Moses, to the degree where in Hebrews 11, he says by faith, when he had grown up, Moses, who refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, he chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. What if when people were sitting around talking about you one day and they're eating the cheese and the crackers and they're at your memorial service, what is it What is it they would say about your faith? When they've grown up, they refuse to be a simple product of their environment. They chose to be mistreated with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. They regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than all the treasures of this world because they were looking ahead to their reward. Would you pray with me this morning? Father God, just give you thanks, Lord. We thank you that we can look at an ordinary guy that I think a lot of us, we love to put these people on such pedestals. We love to look at the Hebrews 11, but we need to look at the story at the start as well, because many of us are right there. We need to start. We need to begin to use what you have given us right this very moment, God. And it's time for some of us to join the team. Maybe for some of us online in this building this morning saying, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready to step up the plan. I'm ready to join membership. Maybe for others of us, it's as simple as saying, you know what? It's not just a slogan. This church just doesn't have a catchy slogan of loving God, loving people, making disciples. I am ready to live this out in my life. And if it's ordinary things like cooking a meal for a family, if it's an ordinary thing like helping an elderly neighbor who lives next door to me, if it's ordinary thing of opening up my house to a small group, whatever it is, you're going to make it extraordinary, God, as we live in faith in those moments, just as Moses did. God, you are with us. Let us not forget that. That when we're cooking that meal, when we're mowing that lawn, when we're opening up our house to a small group, when we're sharing Christ with someone, we're not just doing that in our strength, we're doing that with your strength in us. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you move in such mighty ways. Father, we just give you thanks this morning. In Jesus' mighty risen name. So, some of you have these fancy communion elements in front of you and at home and if you don't at home and you just have some bread and juice you're good as well so let me tell you a little bit about these and we'll take them together i'm going to read some scripture in just a moment but there's kind of two peels on these the first peel is a little wafer that you'll peel off the second peel is the juice it's a little hard i know uh, and so if you need some help from a neighbor or something like that or if you got kids you might have to help them Uh, But you'll take out the little wafer there first, and so you peel back, if I can even do it. (laughs) I got it. You get the wafer, and then you can peel the juice back as well. I want to read some scripture to you this morning, found in Mark. Mark 14, verses 22, it begins, and it says, As they were eating, he took the bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to them, and said, Take this, take this, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank it, and he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. This morning, at home, here in house, it's cool to be able to do this church. We are one body in Christ, no matter if we're in Christmas Valley We're at the coast, we're in town, we're in this space. We are the body of Christ. A building does not hold us together. Christ is who we are and who we serve. This morning, take of this bread.
juice, as I mentioned, represents the blood of Christ spilled for the forgiveness of our sins. We do so in remembrance of him. Father God, as we enter into a time of worship as we close our service, we're thankful that we have opportunity this morning to take of communion in such a cool and different way, a way I've never done. Having people online join us together, having people here in this building, God, continue to use us. Continue to use our online friends and family. Continue to use those here meeting together as well. But Father, we thank you, God, that you sent Jesus down to earth to die for our sins. And Father, I pray in these coming weeks, these coming months, these coming days, that we would be Christ-like in our responses, that as you have forgiven us, we forgive others also. May we be people who live that out and embody that as well. Thank you, God, for the greatest team on earth, your team. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen, amen. Let's join the greatest team, church. Start what you have. Use that ordinary stuff. Let's start with the greatest team on the face of the earth, God's kingdom. Join us. Join us as we're on mission together to love God, love